We are transmitting high atop of Florida's Peninsula at 108 feet. This is Alpha Mike, and you are listening to episode 209. 1970 Organized Crime Control Act, to be exact, will discuss how this act created RICO, destroying the lives of a lot of people. How do you get in contact with us? Well, it's easy. Raidacop.com or Raidacopnation.com. The first one is all our official episodes from 1 to 209. And the second one is the official website of the podcast. Now, hook up with us wherever you get podcasts. It's simple as that. Whether it's Apple. Google, Spotify, Stitcher, Pandora, TuneIn, iHeart, you name it. You look us up, Rate a Cop Podcast, and we will pop up. Social media, same thing. Everywhere but the little bird, which is Twitter. We're not there. Don't look for us there. Twitter is for losers. We are in the Bolshevik states of woke you and me, and they have lost their mind. They have actually and will actually continue to believe that they can take our guns away with the stroke of a pen and drool coming down the side of the lips of sinister Uncle Joe. But it's not that easy, and I don't know what the hell Joe's talking about, that the amendments, not all of them, are a absolute right. He needs to get his underwear changed and he needs some nap time. It is ridiculous what we are witnessing all over the country. Gas prices continue to go up. Delta Airlines has lost their mind. Major League Baseball has put out a bunch of minority people out of employment. Coca-Cola continues to do sugar water. And the country becomes stupider as we go along. Of course, the fake media will never be... uh, proven to actually give correct stories. They kind of miss stories all along, like Hunter Biden. Who's that? They don't even know how to report anything about Hunter. Good old little Hunter with his perverted mind and his fat checkbook. Yes, we live in the official Bolt Bolshevik states of woke. And that is a country where if you're right, you're wrong. Where well, you're wrong, you're right. If you're good, you're bad. And if you're bad, you're good. Everything that seems is not and what doesn't seem really is. That's the society that we live in. We have... comical characters leading government such as Andy I can't get it right Cuomo or Bill the Big Bird de Blasio or Nancy negative Nancy Pelosi Chuck man am I gonna let out a cry Schumer these are the idiots that are in charge of the palace Not to mention our beloved president and vice president, which have absolutely no idea what they are doing. 
as children continue to be locked up in the hundreds of thousands of immigrants crossing the border. They're all given saran wrap and told where to go. But, but don't you worry any because you are only living in the Bolshevik states of woke. And speaking about being woke, it's time for us to reveal the word of the week will wake you up for real. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you are to answer each one. Colossians 4, 6. You can hear more about this word that I've read on a wall. It's a section on our website, Raider Cop Podcast, the, Ra- sorry, RaiderCopNation.com. And there, there's a section that says, hey, well, you look it up and you can hear our episodes on the word or a wall episode all about the b- biblical applications of God. And they're less than 30 minutes. And um, they will uplift you on the verse that we read on these episodes, what exactly they mean for you. You can build yourself build yourself up uh, physically. You can build yourself up with education. You can build yourself up with motor skills on how to be a good law enforcement officer. But if you have an absence of God and you haven't built yourself up spiritually, a lot of what you're doing could be in vain. Today's episode, we feature on episode 209, the 1970 Organized Crime Control Act. This is the act that you could pretty much say is the cash register in the RICO statutes that are soon to follow. This was an act that, and all the other acts, and we'll explain what I'm talking about in a second, they took time to create, to build, it's not easy just, you know, throwing things on walls and seeing if they stick. Very similar to what Joe's been doing with his pen in the Oval Law Office to control guns. But these acts were more, let's say, intellectually put together with legal scholars and particularly... His name was Robert Blakey. He put all this stuff together, and it probably took quite a while. We'll explain how this act, the 1970 Organized Crime Control Act, is there's a section in it that was so powerful that it launched RICO shortly after. And we'll talk about some of the... um, infamous cases that uh, have uh, absorbed uh, the, not only this statue but RICO as well combined and and put that all together for you. This is a part of the Wise Guy series because a lot of people that get hit with the 1970 Organized Crime Control Act or RICO are usually some form of organized crime, but not all. And we're going to talk about who they are as well today. So, without holding up the short bus any longer, it's time to start the show.
All right, let's get right into it. Episode 209, the 1970 Organized Crime Control Act. This is the act that preceded RICO and the Record Tier Influence Act. And let me read to you a little bit about this one act that we're covering today. RICO, which is known as the Racketeers Influence and Corrupt Organization Act, was enacted by Section 901A of the Organized Crime Control Act of 1970. It was enacted October 15, 1970, and is codified at uh, 18 U.S.C., which is, uh, we'll explain the titles and all that other stuff, how that works, and created by Robert Blakey, which was an advisor at the time to the United States Senate Government Operations Committee, draft, drafted the law under the close supervision of, no, not the Communist Party, but the committee chairman, Senator John Little McClendon. It was enacted as a Title IX of the Organized Crime Control Act of 1970 and signed into law by the United States President Richard M. Nixon before he said, you won't have me to kick around anymore, and he left. While it, it originally uses use in 1970 was to prosecute the mafia as well as others who were actively engaged in organized crime. I wonder who they could be. It later, its later application has been more widespread like butter. Beginning in 1972, 33 states adopted state RICO laws to be able to prosecute similar conduct. And when you have all kinds of governments jumping on the bandwagon, you can always count them. There must be some form of financial advantage. And that's why they're jumping on board. So, started, as we stated, this started the road to Rico. We told you who the creator is, Robert Blakey. Not Flakey, but Blakey. And... It took a while to put all this together. You had to get all these statutes together. You had to get these committees of clowns in the Senate to approve and enact all this stuff. And so when we look at these U.S. titles, and we're going to look at uh, eight of them, I believe they are, it's 18 U.S. Code, which refers to uh, the criminal, the crimes criminal procedure section of the law, of the federal law, and the number that precedes that, that follows that, is going to be 1960, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 1968. No, those are not the years. They're the sections that you can find this law, and then we'll give the title, what it is, and what they belong to. And... As a result to the Organized Crime Control Act, and, and we read a portion of it, it was primarily designed in the 70s. Probably the, it began its formation somewhere in the late 60s because the government said crime does pay and we should be getting paid plenty of forfeiture money and civil penalties as well. And so a lot of these acts that were created were for some type of one punishment against whoever they were trying to convict, but mostly as a means of funding for the federal government, whether it's its courts, the prosecutors, uh, Justice Department, or what have you, uh, but a form of, of revenue coming in as well. Some of that revenue would be paid back to victims and so forth. But we know that anything that the government has their hands on can't be all that in a bag of chips. So there might be something's wrong with this. But we're not covering that today. So let's take a look at 
of some of the codes that the 1970 Organized Control Act basically uh, derives from or is part of, and that is 18 U.S. Code 1968. We're not starting from the top. We're starting in 1968 towards the bottom. Remember, that's not the year. That's the section we can find this. And it's titled Civil Investigation Demand. So here, if we go to the statute, and you want to basically read that, and that would be like looking at paint dry slowly on the wall. So we're not going to, you know, go out and, and kill you on that. But we'll give you a little bit of a highlight of what we're talking about. Okay, without putting chalk to the chalkboard and making you cringe, here we go. We're going to read 18 U.S. Code 1968 Civil Investigation Demand. It states on the Section A, whenever the Attorney General has reason to believe that any person or enterprise may be in possession, custody, or control of any document material relevant to a racketeering investigation, he may... Prior to the institution of a civil or criminal proceedings thereon, issue in writing and cause to be served upon such person a civil investigative demand requiring such person to produce such materials for examination. And then it, it goes on and talks about, you know, how that process is going to go down forthwith all those biblical shall uh, terms are on them. So this is setting the stage of where we're going in these other uh, issues as well. So it's going to give you kind of like the foundation of where we're going. So this is a civil and we're going to keep on hitting you with the word civil uh, investigation demand. So basically saying that you have caused to cause more havoc as we go along. So we're going to take it now from the top, and our top is going to be 1961. Remember, that's not the year. And that will start taking us into the rest of all these other codes. And we'll look at it real quick. We're not putting chalk to the chalkboard. Now, here they're going to start actually giving you definitions of what they mean, like the term racketeering. So, obviously, you can't really convict people of a term that nobody knows. So, we got to put that in statutes. So, racketeering activity means any act or threat involving murder, kidnapping, gambling, arson, robbery, bribery, extortion, dealing in obscene uh, obscene manner or dealing in a controlled substance or a listed chemical as defined in section 102 of the Controlled Substance Act which is chargeable under state law and punishable by imprisonment for more than one year. So it kind of breaks down what racketeering is and then it's going to go on and embezzlement and all this other stuff. So putting all this together, now we've got to start putting terminology into it. So you kind of understand what the name of the game is. Now, this section that I just read, 18 U.S. Code, no, uh, 1961, it basically is crimes and criminal procedures. That's, that's the term. So it's going to dictate what the crime is and what is the procedure on proceeding. All right, here we go. We're going to continue to 18 U.S. Code 1960. Let's see if anybody knows in the back rows. Two, the correct. 1962. Two comes after one. That is outstanding. We are paying attention. Class is in session. And this uh, code is crimes and criminal procedures prohibited activities, things that you can't do. So, beginning on the first line, it shall be unlawful for any person who has received any income derived 
directly or indirectly from a pattern of racketeering activities or through collection of an unlawful debt in which such person has participated as a principal within the means of Section 2, Title 18, and, you know, of course, you got to go to Section 2 if you want to see it. We don't have time for that nonsense. The use or in, or invest directly or indirectly any part of such income or the pros, uh, proceedings of such income and blah, blah, blah. And it keeps on, all right? So basically, no, it's not talking about a congressman or a senator. It's talking about some type of gangster that is making money off of racketeering. All right, let's keep on going. I know it does sound similar to government work, but it's not. 18 U.S. Code 1963, that is correct. It proceeds uh, one, and then you get two, and then three. And we're going to dive into this one, and this is Crimes and Criminal Procedures and 1963 Criminal Penalties. Ding, 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 ding. Whenever, whoever violates any provision of the section 1962, so you mess up any any provision, anything, any, any, I don't care what it is, in 1962, of this chapter shall be fined under the title or imprisoned not more than 20 years. We're not going to do 21. We'll do 20. We'll do 19. We're not doing 21. Or for life, if violated, if violation is based on a racketeering activity for such for which the maximum penalty includes life imprisonment or both and shall forfeit the, to the United States irrespective of any provisions of state law. One, any interest the person has acquired or maintained in violation of Section 162. I mean, one, 1962, sorry. So basically what it says, you violate 62, 63, picks your pocket. All right, let's keep on going. After 63, of course, kids, we are bright as hell, so it's 64 now. And we go into U.S. Code, 18 U.S. Code, 1964, and that comes up with a title of Crimes and Criminal Procedures in 1964 for Civil Remedies. The District Court of the United States shall have jurisdiction to prevent and restrain violations of Section 1962 of this chapter by issuing appropriate orders, not inappropriate, appropriate orders, including but not limited to ordering any person to divest himself of any interest, direct or indirect, in any enterprise, impose reasonable restrictions on the future activities or investments of any person, including but not limited to prohibiting any person from engaging in the same type of endeavor as the enterprise engaged in, the activity of which affects interstate or foreign commerce, or ordering the solution of reorganization of any enterprise making due provisions for the rights of innocent persons. Now, you'd have to translate that to the English language, and basically what it's translated to, Uncle Sam can basically just accuse you of whatever you want, because nobody understood what the hell I just read. Now, after we read 18 U.S. Code 1964, we would know we're going in sequential order. 18 U.S. Code 1965 follows, so we're heading in that direction to continue talking about the statute. Now, I hope you're getting a point or you're getting bored. One of the two is happening. This section is crimes and criminal procedures and 1965 venues and process. Any civil action or proceedings under this section against any person may be instituted in the District Court of the United States for any district in which such person resides, is found, has an agent or transaction, try transact his affairs. So basically it says, you know, wherever you're doing these affairs, we can try you there. 
So as we continue, we're going to, you know, get off of reading these things and talk a little bit more of exactly where we're getting at. And what we're looking at more than anything is how these statues in sequential order that we're reading them basically punishes you for the act and now they start picking pockets and basically giving penalties and procedures and how things are going to work. Now, not that necessarily this is all wrong. This is more about uh, how the law becomes so confusing. Now, of course, you hire some guy by the name of a lawyer, the lawyer, and the lawyer should understand the lingo and how to proceed. That's not the part, the point. The point is quite confusing for a juror, let's say. Of course, you're told basically what it means, but all this mumble jumbo becomes more difficult to understand. So I'll give you an example. We're looking at one statute, and it could be anything in the criminal code, federal criminal code, and I charge you on it, and I show evidence to the jury as to how you violated that law. And it goes before the jury. The jury examines the evidence and the testimonies that were given, and they give a guilty or not guilty, and you move on. But here, it's going to start turning into two predated acts. So if you've committed two felonies, they can basically say you're part of a mastermind, and therefore they can make that more difficult uh, in the RICO statute world. And you heard some of these penalties, no more than 20 years and all this other stuff. So the point I'm getting at, and we're going to look at some more of the uh, other cases and some of the famous cases that have gone through, these cases will give you a little bit better understanding of what we're talking about. So, okay, the guy that created this, Robert Blakey, who was he? Well, he became a lawyer in 1957, Notre Dame law professor. And as we discussed earlier, he basically worked as one as for the U.S. Congress or uh, senators and as an advisor for gov- government operations committee. And, you know, a lot of people just call him political hacks. But anyway, that's what he was. And he created these uh, laws. And although the government with RICO said, this was never intended just to prosecute mafia Italians. But those are the ones that got it the most. You tell me. And um, some of the famous cases, well, he got the Cowboy Mafia, the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, the Latin Kings, Key West Police Department, Major League Baseball. Do you believe this? And LAPD. We're going to read a little bit about each one of those cases. Not, not much, but all right. We got 66 uh, and 67 coming up, and we're going to take a little dive into that, and then we'll talk about these cases. All right up next, 18 U.S. Code 18, 1966 Expedition of Actions basically says any civil action instituted under this chapter by the United States in any district court of the United States, the Attorney General may file with the clerk of such courts a certificate stating that, in his opinion, says his, oh my God, they wrote that in 1970, write his today in 2021, see what happens to you. In his opinion, this case is of general public importance. A copy of the certificate of the certificate shall be furnished immediately uh, uh, by the clerk to the chief judge or in his absence. Blah, blah, blah. This is all baloney. So 
So let's go on to the next one, our last one, 6718 U.S. Code, 1967. And that wraps up with a title of evidence in any process, the evidence, how it's going to be archived in any civil action instituted by the United States under this chapter, the pro... The proceedings may be open or closed to the public at the direction of the court after consideration of the rights of the affected person. In other words, we can do whatever we want. So let's take a dive. Let's get a better understanding of what we're talking about. In 1970, the Congress responded to the proliferation of organized crime in the United States. They had a they acted. They did something. They weren't a bunch of goofballs like they are today. By enacting the Organized Crime Control Act in 1970, Section 901A of the Act, commonly known as the Racketeer Influence and Corruption Act, RICO, is designed to combat the infiltration of organized crime and racketeering into legitimate businesses. To accomplish this objective, Congress will provide criminal sanctions under Section 1963 of RICO. All affords government prosecution, prosecutions the advantage of a civil action under Section 1964 of the greatest significance, too. They can basically rob you now. So, RICO is born under this law, this act of 1970 Organized Crime Control Act, and the Section 901A, RICO, little cousin RICO, is born. Now, a lot of people have given their comment of what they believe and feel about RICO, and... I'm not really going to comment too much about that. But this is not a straight pitch like you get in state court when you're charged with a crime. Burglary. Then we got to explain how it happened and the evidence and so forth. The jury listens to it and the roll of the dice. This is much more complex. And a lot of people think that a lot of RICO is unconstitutional. I would say too. Now, what's fascinating is when Robert Blake created all this mess and threw it out there and the Congress made it into a law, nobody knew how to deal with it, enact it. So it sat in people's drawers, law, law, lawyers' office drawers, because nobody wanted to pull it out and use it until 1979 came along. And the first victim, and we've discussed this in prior cases, was the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club. In 1979, the United States federal government went after Sonny Barger and several members and associates of the Oakland chapter of the Hells Angels using RICO. In the United States versus Barger, the prosecution team attempted to demonstrate a pattern of behavior to convict Barger and other members of the club of RICO, offenses related to guns and illegal drugs. The jury acquitted Barger on the RICO charges with a hung jury on the Predate Acts. There was no proof it was part of club policy, and as such, they tried. The government could not come up with any incriminating minutes from any of our meetings mentioning drugs or guns. Well, that was in 1979, folks, and 2021, they still are throwing blanks. Some of the other uh, entities that I told you, famous cases, Latin Kings, several members of the Latin Kings have been convicted of RICO offenses. The Key West, Florida Police Department. June of 1984, the Key West Police Department located in Monroe County, Florida, was declared a criminal enterprise under the federal RICO statutes after a lengthy United States Department of Justice investigation. Several high-ranking officers of the department, including Deputy Police Chief Raymond Castamayor, 
were arrested on federal charges of running a protection racket for illegal cocaine smugglers. The trial, a witness testified he routinely delivered bags of cocaine to the deputy chief's office in City Hall. Another one, how can we ignore the Major League Baseball making huge business deals in the city of Atlanta? Well, back in 2001, Major League Baseball team owner voted to eliminate two teams, presumably the Minnesota Twins and the Montreal Expos. In 2002, the former minority owners of the Expo filed charges under the RICO Act against Major League Baseball Bug Siegel, the commissioner, and former Expo owner Jeffrey Laura, claiming that Siegel and Laura deliberately conspired to devaluate the team for personal benefit in pre- preparation for a move. If found liable, Major League Baseball could be are responsible for up to $300 million in punitive damages. The case lasted two years, successfully stalling the Expos' move to Washington or uh, contraction during or contract talks uh, during the time. It eventually sent to ar- arbitration, where arbitrators ruled in favor of Major League Baseball. Envelopes go a long way, my friends permitting the move to Washington to take place. Major League Baseball charge at Rico. Who knew? Los Angeles Police Department, April 2000, federal judge William Ray, Los Angeles, ruled in one of Rampart scandal cases, said that the plaintiff could pursue Rico claims against the Los Angeles Police Department in unprecedented findings the idea that the police organization could be categorized as a racketeering enterprise shook up City Hall, further damaging the already tarnished image of the LAPD. However, in July 2001, U.S. District Judge Gary A. Feast said that the plaintiff did not have a standing to sue the LAPD under RICO because they were alleging personal injury rather than economic or property damage. Don't ask me how he came to that conclusion. And of course, they've got the big ones in all these cases. Gambino, Lucchese, Bonanno, Chicago Outfit, blah, blah, blah. So Rico has been used for underworld purposes, for police departments. That is also regarded... Many Democrat congressmen and senators believe that policing is underworld activity as well. And, of course, Major League Baseball. But don't worry, they beat theirs. They had bigger envelopes. So you can't accuse everybody. The law has been selectively used to fit the shoe size of specific entities and people. I am a strong advocate that if the U.S. government started playing RICO on companies all day long, eventually these big, strong companies with a whole lot of money would beat these cases, and all of a sudden RICO could be found unconstitutional. So we're not going to do that. We're going to keep on focusing our efforts on thugs and gangsters with eighth grade education and a roll of money that they shoot under the desk for their lawyers to protect them. What can I tell you? Now, what's up next? Well, we're going to have our buddy. uh, Remember, he's a big movie star now. We're not talking about just small potatoes. This is some serious gravy we're talking about. Kilo Sierra, my co-host. And we're going to be doing reciprocity. What you should know. Episode 210. And that comes out April 14th. You know, we got a lot on the back burner. Right after April, May comes in. We're going to 
be seeing two steady shows. They will launch Sunday night and Wednesday morning. A lot more, uh, well, actually a lot less hectic for me in order to put all these shows together. Um, we covered this organized crime control act mostly because we had mentioned it in the wise guys series on the Costa Nostra and once with the hell's angels and we're covering the outlaws we still have a couple of those shows to do so i said let me fit it in now so we can refer to it when we do those other wise guys series episodes so you've got a lot of information on how Rico was born and where is Rico today? Well, Rico is just being used like a bunch of drunks in a bar with darts and a dartboard looking for a blindfold. It's how they use it. What can I tell you? All right, statistics are in, and I'll close with this. In 2019, 650,000 Californians fled the hills and left the state. In 2020, 160,000 Californians hit the, the trail right out of California. 2020, 70,000 residents of the city of New York fled out of there like Fred Flintstone, causing 34 billion dollars in losses for the city and of course uh, all these people are moving to more saner places for example the ones that are fleeing California the majority not all of them have moved to Texas Nevada Arizona and Wyoming and some have trickled as far as down as Florida but they usually stay in the west coast area and then uh, the people fleeing uh, Governor Cuomo, Domo's Ryan of Empire, are coming mostly down south. Now, the bulk of these people fleeing these communist states or Bolshevik states are coming to the southern U.S. And, of course, the southern U.S., what attracts a lot of these people, low taxes, low prices on homes and land and more of a a conservative type view on life. You can have your guns, you have freedom of speech and everything that the Constitution stands for. And if you can't figure this out, that all these progressive states that have these buffoon governors enacting all these Bolshevik laws The numbers are in, folks, and they're staggering the amount of people leaving these places. Majority of them going to the southern part of the United States because it's more conservative. And you still believe that the buffoon in the White House that fell down the stairs at Air Force One, that his dog is a raving rabbit maniac, Got 84 million votes. Hmm. Before you leave, I got some ocean property for you in Las Vegas, Nevada that we need to discuss as well. As always, it is my honor and pleasure to be your host on Raider Cop Podcast. Continue to pray for yourself because without you in the game, we have nothing. Continue to pray for your family, your community, your law enforcement agencies that serve you, and most importantly, continue to pray for the United States of America. This is Alpha Mike, and I'm out.